All right, hello everyone. Welcome to the first lecture video of the year. This is to start out unit one, which is all about the living world. Uh, we're gonna be talking specifically about ecosystems in this unit. Um, this first video is gonna cover species interactions and biomes. Uh, one of the um, biomes that we'll talk about, you can see pictured here, these are mangroves. They're trees that grow in salty water. Very cool. All right, so let's get things kicked off. First of all, we need to understand what an ecosystem is. And that's just a combination of the living things and the non-living things in a given area, right? When I say living things, I use, tend to use the term, in environmental science, we use the term biotic. And biotic refers to anything that's made of living tissue, meaning that it could be alive or it could be dead. But as long as it's made of living tissue, that's fine. So a tree, a dead tree, a squirrel, a dead squirrel, a plant, uh, the, all those things are biotic. Meanwhile, uh, non-living things, things that aren't alive and never were alive, never will be alive, are what we call abiotic. These are things like rocks, soil, uh, water, air, sunlight, heat, etc. If you combine the physical component, the abiotic components, and the living component, the biotic component, together, you get an ecosystem. And that is the, uh, right, the combination of all the different species plus their physical surroundings. That gives you an ecosystem. Here are examples of some ecosystems you might be familiar with. So let's first talk about that living component, species. Mainly, how do they interact? Take a look at this video again. And boom, get wrecked, right? This a video in this picture of a boa constrictor uh, eating a magpie demonstrate one of the most common forms of species interactions there is, and that is predation. But there are other forms too. Um, skip ahead here. Not only predation, but also competition. Two species are competi uh, competing with one another for limited resources. And there's something called symbiosis as well, where two species live in close quarters with one another. Um, and it can manifest itself in one of three ways, which I will get into in a few seconds. Here's a great example of a uh, predation relationship, predator-prey. The hare is the prey, and the lynx is the predator. Lynx is in red on the, X, on the, on the graph, and the hare is in blue. So over time, what we see is that the hare population goes up, and then shortly afterwards, the lynx population goes up. And then the lynx start eating all these hares, so the hare population goes down. And then shortly after, the lynx population goes down. So we see the cyclical nature of when the predator population goes up, the hare population then goes down, and sort of this uh, cause and effect looping type motion. This is a very classic example we call predator-prey cycling. Um, but I want to zoom in on um, symbioses for a minute. Uh, they can be mutualistic, they can be parasitic, or they can be commensalistic, uh, and I'll go through what each of those means in a second. Here's a chart that I use to help me understand these relationships, uh, including predation and competition. Imagine you've got two species, species A and species B. If they share an interaction uh, where one is preying on the other, the predator is going to have a positive uh, impact from that, and the prey is obviously going to have a negative impact. If two species are competing, they're both going to be negatively impacted. Introducing competition in the, into any scenario is going to make life harder for you, um, whether your competitor A or competitor B is irrelevant. Looking at symbioses, now remember these are close quarters relationships between two species, physical uh, closeness. A mutualistic symbiosis is one where both species benefit. A parasitic symbiosis is one where a species A benefits but species B is negatively affected. And a commensalism is a symbiosis in which one species has a positive uh, outcome and the other species has no outcome, totally neutral. Uh, let's explore some possibilities. Uh, let's play a little game. Name that symbiosis. Okay, grand prize, $1,000. Well, maybe not, we'll see. So, uh, see if you can name this one. Okay, so this is, uh, a, these are lampreys. Uh, they are feeding off of a, what looks like a trout or a salmon, right? So these lampreys are parasitic. The trout is having nutrients sucked out of it, which is negative for the trout, but it's good for the lamprey because the lamprey is uh, getting nutrients out of it. Let's try another one. Okay, this is a hummingbird. Remember to be the hummingbird. Uh, in this case, the hummingbird is, um, pollinating this flower, right, which is good for the flower. That's basically how plants have sex and they spread their seeds. 
Uh, so the hummingbird is pollinating the flower, but the, in return, the hummingbird is getting nectar, which is food. That's positive for both. So that's going to be a mutualism. And lastly, okay, so this is a clownfish living inside of a sea anemone. Uh, I would accept either a commensalism or a mutualism, um, mainly because the, the clownfish are getting a place to live, a safe place to live, because the sea anemone stingers um, are dangerous to anybody but the clownfish. Um, and you could argue that the, the sea anemone gets nothing in return. However, uh, there is also to consider the fact that the sea, uh, clownfish are probably going to be defecating inside the sea anemone, which sounds gross, but is actually going to provide nutrients for the sea anemone. So it actually could end up being a mutualism because uh, both species are having a positive uh, 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 impact on one another. Okay. So, uh, we were talking a little bit about competition earlier, uh, and obviously how it has a negative impact on both parties involved. So, species don't want to have negative impacts on themselves, so they're going to try and minimize that competition however they can, uh, right? If there are limited resources, whether it's space, food, nutrients, water, you name it, they're going to compete over it, and to minimize that competition, they're going to engage in a phenomenon called resource partitioning basically means that they're going to use all these resources in different ways, different times, or different places. And this can lead to really unique adaptations. Take a look at this example. You've got four different species of bird all feeding and living on the same tree. But they all uh, get their food from this tree in a different way, right? This woodpecker digs um, pretty deep into the tree to find grubs. This uh, sapsucker drills holes but not quite as deep. Uh, the nuthatch climbs down the tree looking for insects, and the creeper climbs up the tree. So they're sharing the space, and they've specialized in their own little way to reduce competition. Right? Here's another example of warblers all specializing to live in different areas of a Douglas fir tree. Right? You could also compare this to something perhaps more relatable. If you're like me, you grew up with two siblings and two parents, and you had one bathroom to share, you had to partition the resource of that bathroom. You can't all shower at the same time. So you either start showering at different times or you find another way to clean yourself, such as washing yourself in the sink. And I would not recommend doing that. All right? So competition can lead to resource partitioning and uh, that can eventually lead to unique adaptations. Um, eventually, right? like I was saying, those unique adaptations come into play and that leads to the development of what we call a species niche. And a, a niche or a niche However you want to say it, I don't really care. It's the specific conditions in which a species thrives, right? And it's going to be different, a little bit different for every single species. Look at this example here. You've got all these different birds that live along the shoreline, but they've all partitioned their resources. They've all specialized, and they've all developed their own little niche. It's, it's all interconnected, right? They live in different areas. They feed in different areas. They feed on different things, and that reduces competition. Uh, the things that are going to determine a species niche are the availability of food, maybe the temperature of space, humidity, pH, pressure, you know, you name it. Um, all of those things, different species are going to have different preferences and therefore are going to have different niches. Eventually though, um, uh, if you start coming into my territory, that might imp influence my niche. Uh, and uh, to give an example of that, um, Let's look at these barnacles. So uh, ignore everything else on the screen except for this brown photo on the left here, right? We've got these, these barnacles that live on the rocky shore uh, along the ocean coast. Uh, it's called Cathalamus. It's the Cathalamus species of barnacle. And they can live anywhere from the low tide line all the way up to the high tide line. Great. There's no competition between species. Uh, they're doing great. This is what we call their fundamental niche because it shows us where they could possibly live in any um, in, in the ideal world, where would, where would they be able to um, habitate? However, when you introduce another species, like the semi-balanus uh, barnacle, right, you're going to start to see competition. And that competition is going to exclude the Cathalamus barnacle from this whole possible range. Right? So it's going to constrict the Cathalamus to a smaller range. That's what we call competitive exclusion. Right? If there's competition between two species, it can force an, an organism's niche to shrink. And that's the difference between a fundamental niche, all the possible places where it could live based on pH, and temperature, salinity, etc. 
and the realized niche, where the species actually lives in the real world. Uh, because, because of competi competition, it's going to severely limit where that species can actually thrive. Okay, cool. So we just talked about all the living components of, that make up an ecosystem, but what about the non-living components, those abiotic forces? How do those shape ecosystems? Well, we're going to get into that, uh, and it tends to um, manifest itself in some patterns we can see across the globe. But the things we want to pay attention to, the abiotic forces, are things like temperature, moisture, altitude, latitude, nutrients, type of soil, etc. Um, and if we look at patterns in all these abiotic forces, we tend to see patterns in ecosystems. These are things we refer to as biomes. Biomes are just distinct um, areas or communities of plants and animals uh, that you can find around the world and that are based on the area's climate, right? An example would be a tropical rainforest or a tundra or a coral reef. These are all biomes. They're also ecosystems, right? But if you think about the, the scale of organization, I'll show you a diagram in a second, but biomes are a, a wider umbrella, so to speak, than an ecosystem. So uh, these are, are characteristic communities of plants and animals. Uh, I like to think of them as patterns that we find across the world. You find tropical rainforests in South America, in Africa, but also in Indonesia. Here are the, here's a map showing the, the, uh, the world's terrestrial biomes. We've got things like rainforests, deserts, savanna, uh, chaparral, um, boreal forest or taiga. We've got tundras. We in Connecticut live in a temperate deciduous forest, right? All types of different biomes. Um, and you can see there's a connection between where the biome is and the climate, right? Climate is a combination of, of temperature and, uh, whoops, temperature and precipitation. So depending on those two factors, you're going to have a different biome in any given location. Here's that diagram I was telling you about, right? An ecosystem is a, co a combination of the living things in the community as well as the non-living things. But a biome are patterns of ecosystems that we see across the world, right? There are lots of different boreal forests in this sort of t um, turquoise color. We see all in North America, but also Russia and Northern Europe as well. Those are different ecosystems, but we can consider them to be the same biome. They might have slightly different organisms, but generally speaking, we've seen the same patterns going on there. The, as I mentioned earlier, the identities of the biome, which biome it is, are, is driven by the climate. And we can break the climate up into two discrete factors, how hot is it and how wet is it, right? If you look at this diagram, you can see we've got temperature here, hot, really hot down by the bottom, really cold up at the top, and precipitation uh, on the bottom horizontal with really dry on the left and really wet on the right. So let's go to a really dry and hot climate. That's going to give us a desert. Surprise, surprise. How about a really hot and wet climate? That's going to give us a tropical rainforest, right? So a, as you look at the relationship between temperature and precipitation, you're going to be able to more or less predict which biome we're working with. And these are, for the most part, the, the most distinct biomes that we'll be talking about in the class. Here's another way to visualize the same pattern. We've got dryness down here, and we've got temperature over here. Again, very dry, very hot. It's going to give us a desert. Uh, less dry, but still pretty hot, is the tropical rainforest. Um, if we look at something that is pretty dry, or, or we can look at either of these and see this actually, something that's pretty dry but pretty cold is a tundra. A tundra is basically a cold desert, more or less. So uh, two different ways to look at the same thing. Uh, these terrestrial biomes, it's important to note, right, although we see patterns, it's a little bit different everywhere you go. If you go to the boreal forest in Alaska and Canada, it's going to be slightly different than the ones in Russia or Scandinavia. Why? Well, the resources that we find in those areas, whether it's fresh water, trees, so organisms, whatever, are going to vary because in those biomes you've got slightly different climates, you could have very different geographies, latitudes, altitudes, soil could be different, the nutrients in the soil could be different. All those things are going to change slightly, and sometimes not so slightly, the resources that are available in that area. That's kind of common sense, it may seem intuitive to you, but uh, it's important to recognize that fact. Um, I kind of like to think of it like it's, it's resource partitioning, but on a global scale and with biomes as opposed to individual species. <coughs> Excuse me. 
We can use these special graphs to help identify, characterize, and understand biomes. They're called climatograms, technically, according to the dictionary. It's not a real word, but hey, you know what? I'm not going to be picky about that. Take a look at this one. On the x-axis, we've got months of the year. Keep in mind, this is the southern hemisphere. So summer is during uh, December, January, February, and winter is during June, July, August in the south, southern hemisphere. On the uh, y-axis, we've got two things. In red, we've got the temperature, and in blue, we've got the precipitation. What we'll see is that it's pretty hot, 25 degrees Celsius. It's almost 90 degrees Fahrenheit almost all year long, and a lot of rain, anywhere from 300 to 500 millimeters per year. That's anywhere between a third and a half of a meter, right? We're talking multiple feet of rain per year. That's brutal. Meanwhile, if we look at something like the... Um, uh, uh, temperate rainforest, this is like Oregon, Was Washington State, um, we see that the temperatures are significantly lower and a little bit more fluctuation, right? They can still get warm in the summertime, but they are much cooler in the winter. And the rainfall is still pretty high, but not quite as high as a tropical rainforest, okay? Let's compare that to where we live, right? Uh, a temperate deciduous forest, if you pay attention to these axes, we see anywhere where the rainfall anywhere from 80 to 100, which is significantly lower than both the temperate rainforest and the tropical rainforest, whereas the temperature is, is pretty on par with the temperate rainforest. So the difference between the biome on the east coast, where we live, and the biome on the west coast, where Seattle is, for example, Washington State, the difference is really not about temperature so much as it is about the precipitation. It's wetter over there, it's drier over here. But you compare that to a tropical rainforest, it's hotter in the tropics, obviously, and it's also wetter. So these are really useful tools to compare and contrast biomes. Uh, here, take a shot at this. Which biome is going to have high temperatures but low precipitation? Here's the climatogram for it. See if you can figure it out. Okay, hopefully that was pretty easy. It's the desert. It's very hot all, most of the year, uh, and it's uh, pretty dry. And like very, very little rain all year long, right? That's the desert. It's probably the easiest one. Okay, now I want to transition to the last point, away from terrestrial biomes into aquatic biomes. This includes both freshwater and salt water, things like lakes, rivers, streams, but also open ocean, deep abysses, coral reefs, etc. Let's start by talking about freshwater biomes, because these are probably some of the most important biomes on the earth, because they provide almost all of our drinking water, right? Take a look at all the ocean on the earth, about 97.5% of it is salt water in the oceans. So that leaves about 2.5%, that's freshwater. Of that, uh, about almost 80% is frozen in the ice caps, and 20% is underground. We do get some freshwater from the groundwater, but not as much. All the freshwater on the surface is about 1% of 2.5% of all the water. That makes up a very small portion of fresh water uh, in terms of the, the stuff that's available on the surface. So rivers, lakes, etc., uh, uh, don't contribute a lot towards the fresh water, um, which is where we get a lot of our drinking water. So keep that in mind um, going forward. The freshwater biomes tend to have zones, um, and when I say tend, I mean uh, they, they, we scientists have assigned these terms to these biomes. So um, there are a couple different terms you should be familiar with. The littoral, and I don't mean, oh my God, that was literally crazy. I mean littoral is the area near the shore, you can see it labeled here. The benthic is, the zone is the floor of the lake or the ocean, the very bottom. Okay, things like crabs and um, lobsters live down there, right? Uh, bottom dwellers, bottom feeders. The limnetic zone is away from the shore, um, but it's the open surface water. Something to keep in mind is both the littoral zone and the limnetic zone are both near the top of the, of the water surface, so they receive a lot of sunlight. So we call that the photic zone, because the sun gets there. Think photo, like photon or photograph, that refers to light. The light can penetrate both the literal and limnetic zone. But the areas where the light can't penetrate, we refer to as the aphotic zone or the profundal zone. Profundal, that word makes me uncomfortable. I don't know why, it just does. So I like to say aphotic. Here's another diagram showing the same thing. Marine biomes, on the other hand, don't have fresh water. They are all salt water. They include things like kelp forests, salt marshes, uh, cobble beaches, uh, rocky shores, mangroves, uh, coral reefs, open oceans, 
and estuaries, which are where a river meets the ocean, delta, so to speak. Um, I did a lot of research in salt marshes when I was uh, a marine biologist. You can see a picture of me here hanging out inside the salt marsh, having a lot of fun. Um, but these marine biomes play a hugely important role, oh, many roles, but one of the most important roles is that uh, they provide most of the oxygen that we breathe. In fact, the algae, or the microscopic plants that float around in these salt waters, provide over 50% of the world's oxygen, right? More, uh, much, much more than the Amazon. You might think the Amazon are the lungs of the Earth. That's not really true. It's actually the oceans. Uh, and they provide almost all of the dissolved oxygen that's found in the ocean. So these biomes are crucially important, and this fact uh, hopefully is something that sticks with you for the rest of your days. Protect the oceans. And uh, much like terrestrial biomes, the resources that we find in these aquatic biomes, like fish, for example, are going to vary depending on the biome that you're in. Surprise, surprise, if you go to different biomes, you're going to find different temperatures, different nutrients that are available, different salinity levels, how salty is that water, different depths, different turbidities. Turbidity is just uh, referring to the amount of stuff that is floating in the water. It's got a low turbidity, it's very clear. It's got a high turbidity, it's very murky. Anyway, all of these things are going to change the resources that are available. Fish don't like high turbid waters. Um, certain fish like deep water, certain fish don't. Certain fish like warmer temperatures, certain fish don't. Corals, etc. So all of these things are going to vary depending on the biome that you're in. Just keep that in mind uh, when we talk about different ecosystems. Okay, so that's pretty much it. Uh, I'd just like to leave you with this question uh, to, to think about and bring to next class. Look at this map of the biomes. As climate change continues and global warming continues, I want you to consider what is going to happen to this map. How is this map going to change as global warming continues? Come up with your answer. Bring it to class next time I see you. In the meantime, if you've got any questions, if anything from this lecture video doesn't make sense to you, please write it down, bring it to class, email me, uh, send me messenger pigeon, whatever it takes. Um, this is the first of many. And hopefully it suits your learning style. Uh, if not, we will find some ways to make it work, and we will go from here. Until next time, I'm Mr. P. I'll see you later.